a leper scholar versus Jesus in Isaiah 53. Verse 4, chapter 53. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. The sickness is not being righteous. They suffer the sickness of not being righteous and not being in right standing with God. This describes a man that God does not like. A sinner whose life is full of bad events, sickness, and suffering. God's righteous servant will have had persistent hardships and troubles, severely injured, and have been grievously affected, especially by disease. And that's based on these words. When you go look them up in the dictionary, these are the things they mean. Jesus was never, ever, not by the Romans, not by the high priest, ever accounted as being played, smitten, which is a hard blow back in antiquity, and afflicted by God, by anyone uh, in the New Testament even, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know who's never mentioned in here, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, is the Essenes. You get, there was three sects, it's just like today. You got, you got the ortho, uh, you got the Orthodox, you got the Conservatives, you got the Reformed. Well, here's Pharisees and here's Sadducees, and they leave out the scenes. They never see Jesus. As I've mentioned, the Essenes had their own gate. And their founder, his very name, is the Teacher of Righteousness. Founded about a hundred years before the birth of Jesus in the story. They're prolific writers. They, they actually did commentary as, as the Jews did on, on the scrolls, on Isaiah. They had the great, uh, they call it the great scroll of Isaiah. I think that is a scroll that has the entirety of the book of Isaiah, which is some almost 70 chapters, not quite. And they, they embody who Jesus is. They, they, didn't want to live in Jerusalem. They went to these caves up by the Dead Sea and they deplored material things, uh, money. But not all of them left the city. And as I said, they had a gate. And at the gate, they told stories. They just, they, they told big stories and uh, tried to make some money. And of course, pick up supplies and whatever else needed uh, up at the caves. It would, it's not that far away from Jerusalem. But if they heard that there was a man claiming to be who their founder was, they, do, they would have went and checked it out. And if there was anything to it at all, they would have wrote about it. Nothing's written. No word on Jesus. No scrawlings on the cave. Until 40 years after his death. He lived to be about 30. And then in 70 Common Era. Uh, through the first of three revolts. By the Jewish people against Rome. Where they lost. In the first, in the first revolt. Over 50,000 people by estimates. And an awful lot of them. By crucifixion and scourging. But that's when Rome destroyed the temple and started driving the Jews from the Promised Land. There's two more revolts, and uh, each bloodier than the one before. But they finally just destroyed everything, which and, and, and the, the Jews were dispersed uh, eventually throughout the world. And they didn't return until 1948 after the Holocaust. The land lay desolate for over 2,000 years. 
And God knew this when he had Jeremiah write <clears throat> the new covenant, which basically says when the rain blooms again and Jerusalem's rebuilt, he knew it was going to be destroyed and that meant his temple. Because when he comes, he comes with a covenant of friendship that says, I will place my temple amongst you. As in, again, I will place it there. And then in Malachi 3, <clears throat> the last chapter of the prophets, God's last words to the prophets and his prophetic announcement of the day of the Lord, he says in verse 1, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the messenger is Elijah, and he says, And the angel of the covenant that you desire is on the way. He's talking about the new covenant in Jeremiah. But he was wounded. And this is first thought. But he was wounded. Oh, well, the point of all that is verse 5, but he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet to the exiles of Assyria Babylon, which became Persia. When they came back, they were the Persian exiles. At one point, they were the Chaldean exiles. Judah was was taken by Babylon at the time that they had control of it. It was always going back and forth between them and the Chaldeans and the Assyrians who had deported, defeated and deported the northern kingdom in Isaiah's day. Um, were taken to Assyria and Gentiles were imported. And they were there in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. They, they actually tried to stop the building of the second temple. They were trying to intercede with, with Cyrus. But this is what God says to Ezekiel. And going back to this five refinement, what all these harsh words are about. He's going to make him to be a prophet to the exile. And God tells him, I will make your face as hard as theirs. He's talking about the Jewish people, the exiles. And your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them and do not be dismayed by them. And then God maltreats and punishes him for the punishments, for the sins, although that's not uh, said, but that's what the punishment would be for, of the houses of Israel and Judah. He's, he's going to toughen him up. And how's he going to do it? He's going to maltreat him. He's going to bruise him. He's going to crush him, which he does by pinning him to the ground for over a year, 390 days on one side with his arms pinned behind him. Maltreated. Well, just being pinned to the ground is maltreating him. No telling what else went on. Punishment and chastisement. Well, he's told he's got to suffer the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah. Chastisement. There's a few examples in there. But just being told you're going to suffer the punishment of the Jews. And you spent your whole life. He's a priestly man. You, you spent your whole life trying to get them to abide by God's laws and commandments. And now you're being told by God himself that you're going to suffer that punishment. That's chastisement. That's hurting your feelings. And and as I said with me, God coats, he's using his power. He's pulling, the, he's pulling enough 
sorrows and pain and uh, anger and worry out of me in these 13 years and counting. And and the whole time, it's always getting easier for me, which means he's tougher on me. It's harder to pull these emotions out. The idea is I can withstand all the shunning, all the despising, all the people counting me plagued, smitten by God, and afflicted. You know, you, it, back in the days of King David, and it still happens today. You have a disfigured arm like I do from birth. People, there are people out there that say, well, God just doesn't like him. That's why, that's why he looks like that. And that's what King David thought. He wouldn't have anything to do with a crippled, lame, and blind. God didn't like him. He wouldn't be around him. The Assyrian Babylonian exiles were made whole and healed. Only if they listened to and heeded the teachings of Ezekiel of repentance and restitution. The sickness is not being whiteness. It, it's guilt. It's the emotion of guilt, of being sick to your stomach that you're just a bad person. You can't get it right. You know, you're not following the commandments. And, and that's what they're for. These commandments aren't for God. He's not really worried about Human sinning, he knows they're going to sin. He created us, and he knows all things. He knows the Jews are going to sin, and he knows the Gentiles are going to sin. And it's not a race. It's not. There's not a balancing act. Who sins more? That's who I'm going to be with, or who sins less. It's not. It's just not what it's about for him. These laws are for us. They're for the Jews. They're for the world who wants to, to see this, this book of morality and philosophy and how to live your life. And the Jews try to bring it to you, but, but, but everybody... There's so many people that despise them for absolutely no reasons other than that's what they were taught growing up. Prejudice, anti-Semitism, bigotry, jealousy. So this is his this is his fire of refinement that I've been under to make my face as hard as the Jewish people, my forehead as brazen as theirs, so that I won't fear them or be dismayed by them. Again, I'm a Gentile coming from Texas who was an atheist for fifty years. I don't really have any religious background except what God showed me at a Christian mega church and at the largest conservative church <clears throat> in the world. And it, it, it was quite the eye opener, I had to say that. Uh, but, but the important thing, and it, it's such a big part of it, is his power. God tells me, I'm not, I'm not parting Red Seas on this return. He says, I, I'm not bringing locusts and frogs and killing firstborn. None of that's going to happen. The only miracles are going to be the miracles on you in controlling you, in making you into what I need to have, to make you suitable, to make it so you don't get angry. You know, and I had a history of that, a history of fighting at the drop of a hat. You know, it's, it's, in, it's, in, <laughs> it's all in the... The book that my ghostwriter, God, had me type. He, he dictated every word. Of course, I was familiar with it all. And uh, there's a lot of things left out. I would have thought, hey, you know, why don't I put that in there? And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll write the book, okay? You know. And, uh, but it's geared towards Isaiah 53. All of my, I've got over 15 surgical scars been shot to the belly. I impaled my right knee on a broken Coke bottle. It was stuck nose down in the ground with the bottom knocked off. This is the old days where Coke was made out of thick glass. My, I'm running in a field. My dog ran between, just turned into my, underneath my legs for some unexplained reason. <laughs> I went flying through the air and came down on my knees, except my right knee came down on that Coke bottle. And for hours and hours, uh, you know, the doctors that would come in, a couple of them, 
So that it can't it can't be saved. I, we I can't repair that. And then uh, all of a sudden, I hear my mom, who's not very stable. She kind of lets out a yelp and and runs out the door. And you know, I've been in shock, but I'm watching this. And what it was is that she saw a doctor she knew, a doctor on his rounds, not there to work or really just check on things, that had repaired her grandmother's hip when she was in her late 80s. And back then, that was a heck of a story, a hip replacement. And she actually walked again. But she saw him, and, and she knew him, Dr. Kane, and uh, she told him to go and take his leg off. They said they can't fix it. And he came in and everything changed. He was livid. I had been laying in that bed all day and started barking orders. And he went to go put his scrubs on. And they, they actually ran me down in a gurney to that, to that operating room. And uh, I, came, you know, I came out. I had a cast from my hip to my ankle. And he told me, you put any weight on that, you'll never walk again. He says, I think, I think we got it fixed. Anyway, it ended up, I, I, I healed up and I ended up being a track runner. And I did the long jump. And I was pretty good. And uh, I actually jumped off of that leg, the right leg. So it, it came around. It gives me a little soreness. But, uh, but my whole life's been like that. It seemed like I was getting stitched up every two years of my life. When I was 20, I had 10 surgical scars. That's before I got shot. But, you know, and, and then I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I mentioned my mother, uh, her parents commit suicide. Her uncle committed suicide. And she's like a little girl in a way. She's kind of in a fantasy world. Especially if she gets stressed. You know, we've always had to take care of her. Uh, she's never been a cook. She's never been a cleaner. You know, but uh, fortunately, my dad did well enough to usually have a maid around to take care of things. But it was a, it, it was rough, and then I developed headaches, uh, a headache that I had for over 27 years. And do you know, during this time, God showed me that He was the one giving me that headache. It was like I had TMJ, and the, my jaw was just ache so bad. I even had surgery on it. In the whole side of my head, the muscular structure up here, it was just brutal to get through a day. It killed my my dreams of being a trial lawyer. I just I couldn't do it. You know, I could sit and read, and and and, and write title opinions, but that was just too difficult. And it turns out it was him because he showed me because he took them away for seven years. God came to me, headaches gone. And then one day we're out walking, and I went whoa. I said, well, that's what I felt for over 27 years. And I went, no, you didn't. And this is about what he did. He gave me a perception of this. He said, you had to be suffering servant. I said, you know, ultimately that led to my divorce and hurt my children. I tried to get on him. He said, yeah, it did. <laughs> Nothing bothers me. Anyway. Verse 5, but he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. Christian ide ideology is that by the crucifixion of Jesus, the sins of those who believe in him and accept him as their Lord and Savior are forgiven. And they receive eternal life in heaven with Jesus. Okay, this verse says he was wounded because of our sins. He was crushed because of our iniquities. There's no crucifixion here. Now, they would have to be saying we, we're sin free because of the scourging by the Romans. Well, that's not even human sacrifice. That's just taking a beating. Sure, it's a bad beating, I give you that, but I'll say this again. One gospel says that scourging was a slap across the face. So, you know, and there's other gospels in there that, that out there that didn't make it to the Bible. I saw it on the History Channel. So there's, all, there's a bunch of it. It's pretty funny. They got all kinds of different stories for Jesus. 
There's even a different story in the New Testament, book of Hebrews. He says, the writer says, and he partook of the blood and the flesh with the children, so that at death he could defeat the devil and death itself. So he was planning on dying, and that, that would make him defeat the devil. This is the people you, you're dealing with on this human sacrifice. This, this is where it's all come from, people who had such beliefs. Again, this is the age of reason, knowledge, information, medicine, science. But this is the kind of thing, you drink another man's blood, you get his life. Same thing the man's were saying, offer God blood, it gives life. It's take a life to do it, you know. The reasoning is not very sound from the illiterate people. Verse 6. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. There's the guilt. Now that's going to show up again in verse 10. That's going to show up in verse 10 where he is to offer himself for guilt. Well, this, this is the guilt they're talking about. It's from, it's from not being righteous. It's from being sinners. They're saying they have that guilt. Okay, well... Uh, Isaiah, that, that's his people. So that, this is the Jewish people. Now this would happen in a day of the Lord when God requires a man to be his visible representation and speak and write his words. The man of Isaiah 53 who offers himself for this guilt. Take the, and, and, and that's what it is. The sickness is, I'm being righteous. What does the man do? Makes the many righteous. And say, if they listen, he, and basically, you know, tell them, get back to Judaism. Be mindful of the teachings, the amendment of the teachings that I gave Moses, laws and commandments for all of Israel. So, in the day of the Lord, a Gentile is tested by God, and upon passing the test, the man becomes the righteous servant, David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses, because he can do all those things. The, the, these names are almost symbolic. You know, David can be a warrior. Well, he can send me in to, to sit at a meeting between the high brass of the Israel of the Defense Force with him telling me what to tell them if they want to hear from me. Which is why I need the many and the multitude that are made righteous to say it from the rooftops why they believe. Why they've read these books and can see it is impossible that I wrote them. That's the prophet like Moses. I've already handled one third of my task. I'm working on the righteous servant and Elijah. And I'm sure the characteristics of David will come to fruition someday in the future. God tells me, don't think about the Temple Mount right now. He said, it, it's, it, it looks to be an impossibility that we could ever build a temple there. He said, but just wait. It may be 10, it may be 20 years. And again, I have long life. And I can tell this is going to take a long time, so that's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> It may be a real bear living with God, but you do have his Holy Spirit to, to lighten things up, but it's better than being dead. I've been there just about four times, and uh, gunshot, colon cancer, that was a brutal time. Uh, the lung cancer, which never really affected me that much, I had to say, and then of course I was supposed to die at birth. I was premature, seven months, disfigured. My intestines hadn't formed, I couldn't eat, couldn't take milk, and they just, more or less, were just waiting for me to go. And uh, my mother's grandmother, the one with the broken hip, I gave him an old wife's uh, remedy, said boil rice water and get in the water. 
My dad said he threw out a mountain of rice in his last semester of school try, trying to graduate from Texas A&M University, where I ended up graduating myself. But uh, it's a test. And here's why it's a test. Okay, what, why, why, why did I offer myself for guilt? It's because of the, the sinning that the Jewish people have done and the guilt they feel for it. You know, for those that do. And it does. It affects a lot of people. And, I'm, you know, just the fact that God's working in the world again should, should get people a little bit more um, fire <laughs> under their feet to get to, to synagogue. And... Um, But that's why the angel of the Lord is already on the way. In this day of the Lord, when he's sitting, when he's coming and Elijah's coming, and the angel of the covenant and desires on the way. That means he sent the covenant of sin forgiveness before I ever offered myself forgiveness. And what does that mean? Well, the Jews were already sin free. They didn't have to do anything. I mean, they didn't do anything. They're they just got to know about it. All I got to do is just tell them, oh, covenant's here. You're sent for Let's make the many righteous in a, in a kind of easy way. Then I got a nice amendment. Be mindful rather than strict adherence. So that's good. And uh, that's why it's just a test. I mean, it wasn't real. And, and, you know, I didn't know. It says he might give me long life. And that's how he put it to me. And I'm seeing all these words and he's saying, the fire of refinement, these words are going to be applied to you. And, you know, you start thinking, well, it's God. I mean, how bad can this really be? Besides that, I want long life. I'm going to say yes no matter what. And he could have just seized me like he did Ezekiel. But the cancer made me blemished. And what did I say at the beginning? You can't be the unblemished Lamb of God. What does that mean? God knew there was going to be a man... Not necessarily his name, that the Gentiles considered someone who could forgive sins under the laws of Leviticus. So I got this figure, and I had cancer, and it started that cancer orchestrating me getting shot to the abdomen. And um, like I said, I got over 15 scars. I got about four scars just from the gunshot. But... Um, uh, that doesn't mean the violence stopped when he came and talked to me. In 2 Kings, chapter 2, verse 14, this verse, taking the mantle which had dropped from him, from Elijah, and this would be Elisha, his attendant, taking the mantle which had dropped from Elijah, he struck the water, that would be the Jordan, and said, where is the Lord? the God of Elijah. As he too struck the water, it parted to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. See, Elijah is a Gentile. If you read the story, God knows, and Elijah knows, but not everybody knows that Elijah knows. The sons of the prophets didn't think he knew, and Elisha didn't think he knew that that day, God was going to take him up to heaven. But he didn't know, it turns out, if you read the dialogue. But he goes to about three different places, but he ends up crossing the Jordan over into Gentile territory. That's just, again, the Tishbite. There's, there's no Tishbite clan in any ge genealogy of the Hebrews that's in the Bible. So, you know, what's the point of even calling him the Tishbite if you can't figure out which tribe he's even from? That was the point. He's from Ramoth Gilead. Gilead is north of Adam on the east side of the Jordan River. And he actually goes, he parts the water going over and Elisha parts it using his mantle, which is his clothing, uh, like a robe, I suppose going back. So Elisha now is working the same miracles as Elijah. That's what it tells you. But what's interesting is this is the only place in the Hebrew Bible where God is referred to as the God of Elijah. He's always the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I know he's got another, a lot of other names, El Shaddai, etc., etc. But the God of Elijah. 
the God of a single Gentile. That's what that's about. That's what that's about. The God of a single Gentile. See, he wants that point in, again. He is back here with his wrath on the Christians. Now, I may sound feminine in the way I talk, but I am who he selected. And I may sound feminine regarding the reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis, but as God says, well, what else is the reckoning if you don't really show them how unhappy you are? And I show it through you. Because again, he controls my emotions, my moods, my every single word, even my thoughts. They're still my thoughts, but over these years, he's changed me. I think back about how I used to think and, and this and that, and it's changed. I'm not the same man I was through this process, and his power has a lot to do with it. And just learning this power, learning how to, all the different ways to communicate with him. You know, I can talk, I can think, but there's also, he can just put a, what we refer to him here as a knowing. He can simply, I can, I'll explain it this way. I can have a conversation with him. Let's just say I'm thinking, and he's reading, he, he's understanding as though it was coming to his ears. I don't hear one thing from him, and yet I know his answer. And so then I continue the conversation. You know, I respond to what he just sent in to me, but there's no words. It's an instant communication. It's incredible, but it took years. To the, and it took years for me to be able to, to talk with other people, to talk with my folks or this or that. And he's talking to me at the same time. To, to, not, to not let it, uh, you know, to not let it upset me and, and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, 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 got to hear something. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, so where is this God of Elijah? The Gentile Elijah, taken up in a Gentile land. And has the same purpose as the righteous servant who's a Gentile, which is me. So he returns as a Gentile. That's, that's, you know, this whole story, specifically taking someone to heaven. He could have taken Elijah to heaven and not, talked to, not written a story about it. And he already could have said, you know, something he does all the time, did with Moses too. You know, everybody... As soon as that's where Moses went, but what happened? You know, God says, your spokesperson also violated my, our, our covenant. And, uh, and then he hit the rock to get water, and God had told him to uh, ask the rock for the water. And God said, you just embarrassed me in front of the Israelites. So that's it. You can't go into the promised land, which I'm sure has got all kinds of partials and and, and stories in the time of, you know, isn't that a little bit harsh? What's the other meaning to all this? It's kind of like seeing a prophecy that cannot be, you know, like changing the thoughts and minds of billions of people in the world so that they will exalt the Jewish people. Uh, and nations will love nations. That, that sounds like a heck of a task. He's had me for 13 years, and it's a slow process. As he says, I could have made beings that I could do such a thing with instantly, but I didn't do that. That's not my creation. My creation is not made to be changed. It's perfect. It's just what I want because I'm making a heaven for my chosen people. And anybody who wants to join them by conversion and become a Jew, that's what it's going to take. And see, there's God taking another shot to Christians. You want to go to heaven so bad? Become a Jew. See? And he brings a Gentile. <laughs> that, makes the, that makes the Jewish people mad. Seems like the odds are stacked against me. But you know what? I walk into any dark alley with God. Even though I know he'll make me fight on my own. He's going to use his power to help me. And I know that to be a fact. It's part of getting trained up. <laughs> the stories I can't tell you. Okay, that's uh, verse 6. That's the last of the verses, verses by the witnesses of God's righteous servant. That's where the quotes end. Verses 1 through 6 are quotes. Chapter 52, 13 through 15. 
quotes. And it says, my servant shall be, uh, be exalted and prosper. Prosper and be exalted. Okay. And I, I've heard many rabbis say, well, uh, the servant is us. And then later in chapter 3, he calls us the righteous servant. No, no, I was the servant. And I didn't become the righteous servant until I passed the test of devotion. And I'd like to hear about the day that all the Jews gathered as one man. Because that's, that's what it's all about. If you're going to use the name Israel, you've got to have everybody come together as one man. That's how the scripture does it. I don't think the Jews ever got together as one man, stricken by disease, every single Jew on the face of the planet, the country, wherever they were at the time, when they did this guilt offering. And they offered themselves for the guilt that they, it would translate to, we offer ourselves for the guilt that we had. Put it back on us. You know, but we'll be righteous. None of it makes sense. It, it just simply can't be them. And they certainly can't be God's representative in the day of the Lord. That's what the description is for. I'm having a tough enough time and I fit every single verse. I say I'm having a tough time. I don't. It, I tell God all the time, look, hey, uh, yeah, I know nobody's responding, but it's, it's, it's not my issue. It's your issue. It's your day. It's not my day. It's your people. You're the one who said you were going to redeem them. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> you should hear some of the conversations we have, and that even that little argument can go on for weeks. You know they'll beat they'll, they'll beat a horse to death. <laughs> it's just like okay, okay, I get, I get, I, I am responsible for everything. <laughs> I don't, I have no self will. I don't have self thought. I don't, I can't control my own body. You control it. You control my words. You control my dreams, which is actually kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> they actually they do. I come out of the dream and say, well, let's talk about it. You know, there's some lesson in it. <laughs> when they let me sleep. You know, I also found out I can stay up for four straight days. He said, you're not doing anything anyway. You're just laying around here watching TV and <laughs> reading scripture and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm delirious. I said, well, see, that's what he wanted. He wanted me delirious and beat down so that he could come down hard on me with chastisement and <laughs> wounding, crushing, and bruising. It, and that's what it's taking to change me. And, and, and Judaism teaches that God's going to have the entire world speaking Hebrew, perfected, no no sins, no faults. What? <laughs> that's not what his creation, that's not what he did. And you wonder why you've been pen reckoned with and he's using me to do it and dismiss? But, you know, I give you, I give you the out. Go to your flocks, tell them how bad your teachings have been on this Messianic era, study and read the books. Those of you on YouTube, you can make extra, I mean, you can really get this thing going for God. I'm just his representative. You want to do something for him? Come out of this missile with all your followers and raise his prophet up high and say, that is him. Tell the Christians, that is him. He fits the verses. And I'm giving you all the information you need to do it. So anyway, it picks up 7 through 10. The speaker is Isaiah himself. And then God is the speaker in 11 and 12. I'll pick up there next. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. This is, this is an incredible time in history. And as, I, I, as God has, has explained to me, you, well, actually it was the Holy Spirit. He said, you're so lucky. Do you know how lucky you are? He said, you, you're so lucky, it's like if it was a lottery and it was a numbers game, it, you'd have to take every star in the universe. And he says, and you have no idea how many that is, divided by one. That's how lucky you are to win this jackpot, to have us living with you and controlling you and making t your life turning out to be something <laughs> instead of, you know, dead in the ground. So, <laughs> good point. You know, I can't, you know, it's beyond belief. It's beyond something you expect to happen in your life. It's just, you know, it's just, it just is. That's where I've gotten to with it. It just is. You know, this atheist of 50 years, you know, just. And it's a funny story when he first spoke to me. Uh, and it's in the book. I'll let you read it. <laughs> but anyway, we'll pick up with what Isaiah has to say in verse 7 through 10 at a later time. Thanks.